introduction to gravitational lensing. Yeah? Well, in the past, I was uh, devoting three lectures to this subject. Yeah? And now I changed because I wanted to introduce you to basic yeah, concepts in astronomy, which I did yeah, during the past two lectures. So, well, first of all, and just a few pictures about you know, the moon eclipse. Who among you saw the moon eclipse? You, you, nice, you too. <laughs> so this was around uh, 10, 11 o'clock in the evening, yeah, just to, well, <coughs> here I just uh, reduced slightly the exposure time, and here it was during the, the eclipse, yeah. Here another one, yeah, where I increased a little bit the exposure time. But it was nice, yeah, very nice. Yeah. Okay, now, what I'm going to talk about today yeah, is based on a paper, a review paper that has been published by Sir Evzdal and myself, well, many years ago. And well, very unfortunately, yeah, well, Sir Evzdal passed away, but he can really be considered as a father of the theory of gravitational lensing, yeah. And uh, his history started in, uh, when he was a, a master student, yeah, he just made the end of thesis, well, end of study thesis on two effects. One was dedicated to the synchronization of the clocks uh, in a relativistic motion around the Earth, yeah, and the second part was about gravitational lensing. And uh, well, he's a promoter, yeah, just considered that everything what he wrote about gravitational lensing, namely, to, to infer the value of the Hubble parameter from measurement of time delays between multiple images of a cosmic mirage, yeah, was uh, not realistic, that probably made mistake. But on the basis of the first part of his thesis, yeah, he got the degree. And then he submitted two papers in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomy Society journal. And uh, uh, the Referee was Siyama, a very well-known physicist, and he just said, wow, fantastic, your work is really a very nice contribution to science, yeah? And so when he was, I think, 29, he got a professorship in the United States, yeah? And then when he came back to Hamburg Observatory, where he was a professor, and he continued uh, with a very big team working on that subject. But he was, he was working in secrecy because at that time, gravitational lensing was considered as a, a kind of dream of astronomers, something not realistic, that it would never be observed, and so on. So, he didn't de well, he didn't show up, you know, uh, well, most of his works because uh, he was afraid, you know, of a bad criticism, and he was working on st stellar evolution. But after in 1979, when the first example of gravitational lens was discovered, yeah. He was, well, really uh, recognized yeah, as a very big scientist in that field. Yeah. Okay, so just a short uh, layout of my talk, yeah? introductions and historical background of gravitational lensing. Then I will just uh, initiate you also to the formation of atmospheric mirages. Yeah? Then lay down the physical basis of gravitational lensing. Then I will just jump to, to this section uh, introducing one model, the model of the black hole, yeah, or of a compact lens, which could be a star, which could be a planet, something very compact, yeah, or, or a black hole. And that's all. So in the past, I was devoting more time to the other aspects, yeah, but not, not now, because we, we don't, have, don't have that much time. Okay, what is a mirage? Well, a mirage, I, I wrote, is an optical illusion but whose cause is real, yeah? So, when I was a child, I remember, and I would see on the, on the very, uh, in summertime, yeah, on the road, yeah, in, in the distance when it was very hot, yeah, you could see those mirages, and I, I was asking my, my parents, what, what are these? And they would say, well, these are just optical illusions, yeah? But no, there is always uh, something at the origin of that, yeah? So, well, here is very famous, yeah. You see uh, Tintin, yeah. So it's uh, very famous in Belgium, you know. <laughs> uh, who sees something who look, which looks like an oasis, yeah. 
And then he comes very near to it yeah, and just realized that it was a mirage. Yeah? So sort of illusion, if you want. And here, where well, it's also very famous, the Dupont brothers are driving in the desert and they are very, very warm. And they are dreaming. And they, they have the impression they see an oasis. And when they are just uh, diving in it, yeah, they realize that there is nothing. Yeah? Well, and this is another one. Yeah? It's a Captain Haddock. Yeah? who thinks to see somebody, yeah? and then he sees a bottle of champagne, but he was a drunkard, you know, he was drinking too much alcohol. So it's dangerous. Yeah? That was not an illusion. Now, now, what is a mirage? Yeah? Well, first of all, yeah, what I have depicted on this diagram yeah, is an observer looking at a very distant source. And most of the time, yeah, the light rays propagate along straight lines. Yeah? And so, the image is really located yeah, where you see the source. Yeah? Because, well, you see the image yeah, in the prolongation of the rays which enters your eye. Now, in the second case, well, the guy sees a mirage. Yeah? Because, well, the, the light ray goes along a curved trajectory. And so the, the observer sees the image of the source in the direction of the incoming light ray. Yeah? This is already may, may be called a mirage. Yeah? But sometimes light may propagate, you see, along different trajectories with propagation times which are always uh, extrema. Yeah? And so, well, if you adopt uh, the Fermat principle, you may really account yeah, for the formation of those multiple images. Yeah? So in this case, yeah, the observer will see as many images as there are light rays entering his eye along different directions. So, well, this is sort of magic, of course. Yeah? Now, <clears throat> what I've written here, yeah, the Fermat principle, yeah, is, uh, is really something fantastic because there is no demonstration, yeah? But it states the following, uh, following argument is that if you have a source of light here, yeah, and if you are an observer there, and let's imagine that the refractive index varies in the room, yeah, so because of a convection motion of the air, yeah, well, the light ray will follow a trajectory which minimizes yeah, the time propagation. Yeah? So it's really fantastic that the light ray knows where to pass yeah, to go to the observer yeah, by, by the path which will take, well, the minimum amount of time, usually the minimum. But sometimes it could be the maximum amount of time. It, it is an extremum, yeah, not necessarily a minimum. Yeah. And, um, of course, there could be the possibility that another light ray goes there, yeah? and if around that trajectory yeah, there is another extremum, then the observer may see, may see several light rays. Yeah? This is very nice. Yeah? Now, well, my interest in gravitational lensing starts back, well, here it was 1987. We just identified using optical telescopes, yeah? very good candidates of uh, multiple image quasars. Yeah? So the, these are very, very distant objects. And uh, well, gravitational lensing yeah, uh, has the following characteristics, is that it is achromatic, in fact. It doesn't depend on the wavelength. So if you see it at optical wavelengths, you should also see it at other wavelengths, like in the radio. And so well, we initiated a program to observe our candidate with a very large array which is located in Socorro, New Mexico. And w w when I visited uh, the site, the radio telescopes yeah, were displayed in their largest configuration. So the, the, the longest distance between the two more distant antenna was about 35 kilometers, yeah? because they may transport yeah, those antenna with uh, very big trucks. Yeah? Well, in fact, actually, they do that on, on rails. Yeah? They have a double tracks. Yeah, and they are just lifting, uh, I think, something like, I think, 45 tons. Yeah? So it's quite heavy. And, well, this is another view. Yeah, it was a very large array in a very compact configuration. And when I was um, <coughs> uh, visiting uh, the VLA, it was in 1987, 
In fact, no, in 1988, yeah, sorry, uh, we, with a friend, uh, we were walking along one of the array, and uh, what we were seeing is that the second last antenna looked brighter than the previous one, and maybe even the fourth one, yeah? And so we, we were wondering, yeah, what can be the reason? And uh, so we thought, well, let's, let's assume that these are cosmic objects in the sky. What could be the reason that if all the objects are of the same nature, that one which is so distant looks brighter than another one which is closer, yeah? So we said, well, maybe that antenna is much bigger, yeah? But we knew, no, they were all the same, yeah? Another reason could be that, well, it was not at the distance we thought it was, it was, yeah? So maybe it was out of the rails, but we knew it was not the case. Another reason could be that it was differently oriented, yeah? And then reflecting the sunlight, yeah, in another way could uh, give us the impression that it is brighter, yeah? So we didn't know. So we went to the control room and we borrowed, yeah, from the operator of the array, well, a pair of binoculars. And what we saw, yeah, was the following. That this second last antenna, yeah, was composed of two images, yeah, produced by atmospheric lensing, yeah? So I will come back in a moment. So, of course, instead of seeing one antenna, we were sort of seeing two antenna, which look brighter than a single one, yeah? Okay, I'll come back to, to that in a moment, yeah? Now about gravitational lensing, yeah? So already uh, in 1704, yeah, Newton, yeah, uh, made the following statement. Don't bodies act upon light at a distance and by the direction bend its rays and it is not this action strongest at the, le at the least distance. So you, you already thought that a massive object, yeah, could bend, yeah, the trajectory of light rays, yeah? So le let's assume that <coughs> This is the sun, and here I am, and I take a, a ball, yeah, and just throw it, yeah, with a very high speed, yeah, in that direction. We know that due to the gravity of the sun on the ball, well, it will be deflected, yeah, yeah. Now, <coughs> it's very likely that if the velocity is not large enough, yeah, well, the ball will crash on the sun. Now, if the velocity is extremely high, well, it may just pass by, maybe, yeah. And this is just a collision problem, yeah? So interaction between two bodies. So with a, well, Newton, uh, I would say, theory, you can solve the problem. And you may do the following. Let's assume that the velocity of the ball is that of light, yeah? Which is the case for the photons, yeah? And for the light. What would be the deflection angle if a light ray, yeah, just graze, yeah, the limb of the sun, so pass very, very near, yeah? And well, you can do that in the in the framework of Newtonian mechanics, yeah. And you find that the result, yeah, is twice the gravitational universe, well, the constant of gravity, universal constant of gravitation, times the mass of the body of the sun, divided by the square velocity of the object. In this case, it's the light, yeah and divided by the impact parameter, which is the least distance, yeah, where the ray should have passed, yeah? So it, it is this distance, in fact, yeah? Well, in this case, we take the radius of the sun. And if you make the calculation, and this was made by Zoldner, who was the director of Munich Observatory, 100 years after the conjecture, conjecture of uh, Newton, he found that the deflection angle should be about 0 0.9 second of arc, yeah? So you remember last time we we <coughs> we just made a comparison between regions and seconds of arc and degrees. Yeah, so it's a very very small angle. Yeah. So typically, when you observe with a very very good telescope under extremely good seeing conditions, where the size angular size yeah of the star is about one second of arc. Yeah. So the due to the atmosphere yeah which deteriorates the image quality. This is in a very good site, yeah? If you look here in Yej, yeah, with a telescope, even a big telescope, stellar images, you will see that probably their angular size is more like five seconds of arc, yeah? Because the atmosphere, yeah, is a 
much more uh, agitated here. So this is a very, very small effect. Then during the 18th and 19th centuries, you know, prevailed uh, uh, the wave uh, description of light. Yeah? And people said, well, our wave could be deflected yeah, by gravitational field. It's not possible. This is wrong. It could. But they didn't think that <coughs> well, gravitational lens, well, gravitational lensing could operate on a, on a wave front. Yeah? So it was forgotten. Yeah? And then it was Einstein, yeah, who in 1911, in fact, yeah, uh, so, well, until recently, maybe 10 years ago, we didn't know about that, that uh, publication, which is not a publication because uh, people found on a train ticket, yeah, that he did all the theory, yeah, of uh, gravitational lensing, yeah, and th th this was uh, forgotten, and uh, it's someone in the Tel Aviv University who found yeah, this train ticket, where he described correctly yeah, how much should be the deflection angle in the framework of a general relativity. Yeah? But he had made a mistake. Yeah? He found the same value as uh, Zollner found in the context of uh, Newtonian mechanics. Yeah? And it's because, well, uh, is the general relativity was not yet uh, fully finished at that time, yeah? yeah? But this was very fortunate because in 1914, there has been an eclipse expedition in Siberia yeah, to try observing uh, yeah, this, uh, well, a solar eclipse and to measure the deflection of light. And because of the war, yeah, it didn't take place, yeah? And this was very fortunate, otherwise people would have observed that it was not the value predicted in the framework of Newtonian mechanics, yeah? And uh, it was very fortunate that this expedition didn't take place because in 1915, well, <coughs> when uh, Einstein published yeah, his uh, general relativity, he realized that, well, he had made a mistake and here the value of the deflection angle is twice as much what yeah, you find in the context of Newtonian <coughs> mechanics. Yeah? So this is a re relativistic effect. So you see the deflection angle, instead of being about 0 0.9, is about 1.8 second of arc. And then, well, in 1920, uh, was another solar expedition in the, south, well, in the southern hemisphere, in Brazil, also from Africa. And, uh, well, a team which was led by Dyson and also Eddington, yeah, just found within an error of 20-30% yeah, that this was the correct value. Yeah. So what, what they did, yeah, they observed the sky. Well, this is, let's say, midnight, yeah, let's say 1st of January. And then six months later was a solar eclipse. So here is the sun, but hidden by the moon, so that you still see the stars. And when you see the very nearby stars, yeah, they are slightly moved away because of the deflection angle, which is inversely proportional to the impact parameter. So if you look very far, yeah, well, the positions are the same, of course, yeah, but if you look very near, yeah, they've moved away. Yeah. And so <coughs> this effect was uh, measured yeah, in 1920, and this was, of course, a triumph for general relativity. Yeah. It was a second proof yeah, of its validity. Yeah. Well, since then, yeah, already uh, in 1975, yeah, but many more experiments were made later with radio telescopes, yeah, they confirmed that value yeah, with a precision which is much smaller than 1% uncertainty. Yeah. So <laughs> there is no more doubt about this gravitational lensing effect. Okay, now, well, on the train ticket in 1911, yeah, which was not published, yeah, Einstein already predicted that under you know, favorable alignment condition, conditions between two sources, one a foreground object and a background object, you could probably also produce multiple images, not just a slight motion of a star, but produce yeah, maybe two images of a distant star. Yeah? And well, the idea is the following, and this you could make, yeah, uh, with, uh, well, at home, yeah? You just draw here, you see, 
a beam of parallel light rays yeah, coming from a very distant source. Yeah, yeah, there. And here, you just put the sun or a black hole, but a pond mass yeah, lens. And as I said, yeah, let's assume that here yeah, you deflect the light ray by 30 degrees. Yeah? And this is one centimeter distance yeah, from the pond mass center to the ray. If you take another one, which is, let's say, maybe twice as distant, then the light deflection yeah, should be half, yeah, 15 degrees. If you go still farther, yeah, the deflection angle will still be smaller. And so you see that, OK, in the plane which contains yeah, the source of light, the lens, which is a point mass, and the observer, so you have three entities, so there is only one plane yeah, containing these three entities. Yeah. Well, all the rays passing on the right side will be deflected to the left, but all the light rays passing to the left will be deflected to the right. And what you see on this diagram is that each pair of rays yeah, intersect each other yeah, somewhere. Yeah? With the conclusion that an observer located anywhere yeah, will always see two images yeah, of the distant source. So this is a conclusion. Now there is a particular case when the source, the point mass lens, and the observer are perfectly aligned. If they are perfectly aligned, yeah, well, by line pass an infinity number of planes. Yeah? And so you should see this scenario yeah, in all those planes, which means that you'll see two images, two images, two images, yeah, along all the directions. And then you will see what is known today as a, well, Hualson ring or Einstein ring. Yeah, yeah. So this one, ob this observer will see two lensed images. Yeah. So one located in that direction, and another one located in that direction. And this one will see an Einstein ring because it's perfectly aligned. Yeah. Now, well, what you see here is that the point mass object. The deflector yeah, consists of a very imperfect lens because there is no focus, there is no focal point. Yeah, yeah. But this is very fortunate because if you, if it was a perfectly converging lens, the probability that an observer would be located exactly there is uh, well, very improbable. Yeah, very unlikely. Yeah. But now, what, what is nice, well. We, I, can, I come back to the previous slide. You see that the deflection angle here yeah, is irrespective of the wavelength. The wavelength doesn't come in too, yeah, this expression. It's just an angle of deflection for all the waves of the, in the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah. So this is, a, of course, a, a very nice property that uh, gravitational lensing yeah, is achromatic, yeah? so it doesn't depend, it should not depend on the wavelengths. Okay, here I will just say a few things that, well, Walson was the first yeah, to predict uh, the possible formation of a, what is known today as an Einstein ring, but it should be called a, a Walson ring. Then Esselington yeah, just uh, demonstrated the conservation of the specific intensity of light in a gravitational field. So last time, yeah, you remember, I, I made a small demonstration about the, the, uh, the fact that the specific intensity coming from a source yeah, is uh, preserved. Yeah? Whether you, it's something which does not change. Yeah? Yeah? So the, I, I told you that the intensity at the solar surface of the sun is the same as the measured intensity on Earth. Yeah? But here, well, it just extended that um, <coughs> property yeah, in gravitational field. So there is no effect. Now, Einstein in 1936 yeah, was contacted by a Czech engineer who told him, well, Sir Einstein, yeah, well, would it be possible yeah, to get multiple images yeah, with, uh, thanks to the gravitational lensing effect? And then he replied, he said, yes, of course. I mean, uh, this is absolutely possible. And in a letter, yeah, he just gave uh, the proof. And then the Mandel told him, well, 
please maybe publish yeah uh, this uh, this uh, theory because well you just laid down the theory and you say no it's nothing important you know for other things to do but the Mandel was very much insisting yeah and finally everybody knows that well he published it yeah but almost against his will and I'm pretty sure today that if he would not have got the Nobel Prize yeah because well of his work on the photoelectric effects and so on he would he would have get it yeah he would have got it yeah uh, thanks to this nice contribution but still in, in that paper so he, he laid down the theory yeah the same as he did on the 20th in 1911 yeah but with the correct value for the deflection angle which was twice yeah, as much now in 1936 yeah, Einstein said in his paper well but the probability of observing that yeah is very unlikely yeah so probably you will never observe it yeah because well, he was thinking maybe about uh, gravitational lensing between stars and that the conditions of perfect alignment to see this effect yeah, are very stringent. Yeah. Zuchki, 1937, well, just found about the existence of very massive galaxies, clusters of galaxies, and the mass yeah, implied in those groups of very massive objects yeah, is, uh, well, <coughs> 10 to the 12 times yeah, higher than a single star because there are so many stars yeah? and so he said well the probability that gravitational lenses will be found <coughs> among galaxies is a certainty yeah 1937 so well, the idea is the following of course is that if uh, between an observer and a distant source here a quasar yeah a quasar yeah is a active nucleus of a galaxy yeah so sort of black hole accreting matter yeah just in the center of a galaxy, yeah, which is typically composed yeah, of a hundred of billion stars, yeah, a galaxy. Well, the light rays yeah, you see pass here and are deflected. The other light rays maybe goes other direction and are also deflected. And so the observer sees many images of the distant source. But it was not found until well, 1957. Still nothing. You know, Zuchki was uh, very he was very worried about that. And the reason why he didn't find it is that if you see uh, two galaxies yeah, which look more or less the same, well, okay, it can be an example of a gravitational lensing, but it could be two interacting galaxies as well, yeah, belonging to the same group. And it's very difficult yeah, to prove whether it is a gravitational lensing effect or not. Yeah. Now, w w what was uh, good, so here is another view, yeah, of uh, how an observer located here sees projected on the sky two images yeah, of the distant source yeah, because uh, yeah, the light rays yeah, have been deflected. Yeah. Now, in 1963, yeah, uh, Martin Schmidt yeah, uh, <coughs> just uh, unveiled the, what, what was a quasar. Yeah? So, a quasar is a very uh, it's a quasi-stellar object, so it looks like a star in the sky, but in fact it's a, it is a monster. Yeah, it's a very compact object located in the center of galaxies. Yeah, probably consisting of a black hole accreting matter. Yeah, a lot of matter and uh, well, <coughs> just uh, throwing in the universe a large quantity of energy. Yeah? So their nature was identified in uh, 1963. And the first candidate yeah, of a doubly imaged quasar yeah, was uh, proposed by Walsh, Carswell, and Wayman in 1979. Yeah? So you see from 1934 to 1979, there have been uh, almost 45 years. And uh, well, it lasted very long until the community of astronomers acknowledged that this was a doubly imaged quasar and not two twins, yeah? Okay, I just pass on that. Well, until that day, that, until 1979, maybe on the subject, yeah, there was maybe 100 papers published on the subject, yeah? And today, well, there are probably more than 10,000 yeah, scientific papers, yeah? Every week, yeah? There are more and more. Now I'm coming back to atmospheric lensing, yeah? yeah? And just try to give you 
a clear idea why the lights are deflected yeah, in the atmosphere. Yeah. What I've depicted here is just a uh, well, road yeah, above which are, is rarefied here at the bottom and more dense in the top. Yeah. So there, there is a sort of a temperature gradient. Okay. And here is a distant source of light which emits yeah, a spherical wave. Yeah. And I have represented here yeah, two small elements yeah, of that sphere. Yeah? So infinitesimally small elements. Yeah? Now, as you know, the velocity of light yeah, is 300,000 kilometers per second divided by the refraction index of air. Since the air is more rarefied here at the bottom than at the top, yeah, the light velocity is higher here than there. So what I've shown here is our two vectors representing the velocity of light yeah, here at the bottom of this uh, infinitesimal surface element and here at the top. Since the air density is higher here, so the velocity is a, a bit smaller. Yeah. So how does it propagate? How does this uh, element on, of the wavefront propagate? Since the velocity is higher here, well, it just goes like that. Yeah. It, it's bending. Yeah. And the light ray is always perpendicular yeah, to the wavefront. Yeah. So the distant observer yeah, sees one light, light rays coming from here and another one coming from here because here you see I have assumed that the refractive index is constant here. So the light velocity here is the same. So this element just propagates yeah, along a straight line. Yeah? So this is basically the physical reason. Now here, well, I I in the past, yeah, we, were, uh, we spent a lot of our time just photographing atmospheric mirages. And these were made uh, in 1987 in Chile. So you see a distant truck yeah, coming, and you see double images. Yeah, but so it's just uh, atmospheric lensing. This was amazing because we are very, very far away, and uh, we could see a bright spot of light. So we could not uh, resolve the car, and uh, it really looked brighter than you see the truck. And then well, we took a picture, and you see that the secondary image you see here is even brighter than the upper one, yeah? So when uh, you're lacking some angular resolution, yeah? You just integrate the whole light and it gives you the impression that it is very bright, yeah? So, well, this is a schematic, yeah? Showing how uh, the, the light bends in atmospheric lensing. This was amazing, yeah? This was uh, in uh, 1989, one year later, uh, when I returned to the VLA. Well, I, I just rented a car from the airport, it was after midnight, to go to the site. And uh, it is in the desert, yeah? so the roads are very, very straight. And I was driving and um, nobody, nobody. And then suddenly I, I saw some light and I said, oh, how bright it is, so I'm going to cross it yeah, in two minutes. Yeah? And it took almost half an hour, 25 minutes yeah, to and I was victim of an atmospheric lensing effect. And so on the next day, yeah, I went along the road and, and, and I took a camera with a long focal length and uh, saw a very distant, very distant car along the straight line and just took a picture. And this is uh, how the picture came out. Yeah? So you see that, well, I was uh, just recording yeah, multiple yeah, images yeah, of that distant car and I had therefore the impression that it was much nearer to me because it looked so bright. Yeah, but so I was victim yeah, of that effect. Yeah. Then this is so one year after uh, I had seen yeah the atmospheric lensing on the very large array. Well, just on the day of my departure in the morning, yeah, I just uh, went out of the room. It was four or five o'clock in the morning. And I looked, yeah, and I was very surprised to see uh, strange shapes of antenna. You see, this antenna, these are elongated like that. This one more like that. Then a bit farther, you see uh, here double images, yeah. And this was also atmospheric lensing. But in the morning, the air is cooler on the ground than upper, yeah. And so the light rays, instead of going like that, as I showed before, yeah. They were going like that, yeah? And so this is called uh, upper mirage, yeah? Upper mirage. 
So it's very rare, but it happens here. Yeah. yeah, so what you could still see on this picture, these are bills, well, buffalo bills, yeah, just uh, cows, yeah, just uh, eating the grass. So it gives you an idea yeah, of, the, of the size yeah, of the antenna, which is something like 25 meter in diameter. Okay, now, now if you'd like to, to make the theory of uh, atmospheric lensing yeah, and uh, even simulate uh, mirages with your computer, yeah, well, it's very simple. It's, it's made in the nodes, but I'm not going to spend time here. But you may just start from the Fermat principle, so which states that the propagation time of a light ray between uh, the point of emission and point of reception is an extremum. Yeah? So this is yeah, telling that this quantity is an extremum. And so you see I integrate from an origin to a destination the time it takes to the light to travel. So I divide the distance element ds prime by its velocity. But the velocity is c divided by n, the refractive index. Yeah? And when you just calculate that extremum, yeah, you just get the snell descartes law. So it's a, it's a law of refraction of light. <laughs> it's what you, you find out. Yeah? So it's amazing that the Fermat principle yeah, leads yeah, to the, the snell descartes law of refraction of light. And now, since you know that this is a constant, yeah, well, here it's not, the, it's not a sign because I didn't take I, the angle I is the angle between the horizon yeah, and the propagation direction of the light ray. So this is I. And in the Snell Descartes law, it's the angle between the normal yeah, and the incident light ray. So it's just a compl complementary. So if you take the cosine of one, you find the sine of the other. Yeah? And now, since you know that this is a constant, you, you just make a different, differentiation. And you may find uh, how the deflection angle, yeah, uh, well, w what is the expression of the deflection angle? It's, it's very straightforward. And then uh, you put that in your computer and uh, just play with it and simulate atmospheric lensing effects. Yeah? It's fun. I did that uh, <coughs> in the past. Yeah. Now, this is another view of uh, atmospheric lensing effects when going down from Paranel in, in Chile in a, at the ISO observatory. So you see that there are very strong temperature effects yeah, on, along the, the road. Well, this is taken from the web. This is in uh, Antarctica. And uh, this is a pure uh, atmospheric lensing effect, too. Yeah, upper mirage, yeah. It's also due to the fact that the ground is cooler than the air above. And here is still another one, which is very nice, yeah. And this is this may be called a Fata Morgana, yeah. And a Fata Morgana, yeah, in, in, late, in Latin, yeah, uh, means uh, the fairy Morgan, yeah, Morgan fairy. And uh, Morgan was a sister of the King Arthur, yeah. And uh, she was uh, spending some time in Messina in Italy, so it's very near, very near to Sicily, yeah. And uh, she could see in the morning, yeah, the kind of castles on the sea, yeah. And uh, she was showing the people, look, my castle. And so people were, well, attributing to her, yeah, the power of constructing castles on the sea, yeah. And therefore, she was named Fata Morgana, yeah, the fairy Morgan, yeah. So this is the origin of the, of the word. But indeed, yeah, well, we, we have already seen, yeah, such a thing, yeah, when traveling, uh, well, in Germany, south of Germany, and it's very impressive, yeah, to see uh, this construction, which are just due to, to atmospheric lensing, especially when you have uh, abrupt changes in temperature. So, for instance, in winter, if there is an anticyclone, yeah, so I mean, uh, so that during the night it's very, very cold, but <coughs> early in the morning the sun, yeah, rise up, yeah, and it warms up, yeah, then you, you will get very uh, strong temperature gradients, and then you, you may see such a things even from here, yeah. Okay, now I come back to gravitational lensing. 
And so we are going to make a, a little bit of theory now. And so what, what I've represented on that diagram yeah, are, you see, uh, a deflector symbolized by M. And well, during this lecture, I shall only consider a compact deflector, yeah, which can be a planet yeah, or a star or a black hole, anything which is very, very compact, which can be considered as being point-like. Yeah, if you want. And now there is an observer here. Then you see there is a straight line, yeah, the dashed line, which is exactly the direction where I see in the sky yeah, the deflector. Now perpendicular to that, li to that line, I trace three perpendicular planes yeah, passing through the observer, the deflector, and the source. And so the first one will be named the observer plane, the deflector plane, N or the lens plane and the source plane. Now you see well the soul is not perfectly aligned, of course, this is a general case. And I assume that this light ray well doesn't continue like that, but due to gravitational lensing, yeah, is deflected yeah, by the angle alpha. So this is the Einstein deflection angle. And we have seen before yeah, that uh, well, to establish uh, its correct expression, yeah, you need to do that in the framework of a general relativity course. Yeah? But here, I just take uh, the value or the expression you get from Newton yeah, and multiply by 2, because there is a correct correcting factor. But remember that the deflection angle, yeah, alpha, well, I represent it with a vector, yeah, is equal to minus 4c divided by c squared times the mass yeah, of the deflector divided by zeta. So zeta is this distance. It's, it is the impact parameter. And then I multiply by zeta over zeta. So this is a unit vector. Yeah? And you see that the, the deflection angle yeah, goes opposite, of course, yeah, to the direction of the impact parameter. Okay. Is it any question? It's okay. Don't hesitate huh, if you have a question. Yeah, yeah. Now you see that uh, theta s yeah, is a angle vector. Okay, angle vector which locates the true position of the source. Yeah. So, what is an angle vector? Yeah. Well, angle vector. Is simply let, let, let's assume yeah, that the distance here, I could say okay is uh, is maybe y s. So the vector coming from this point to the source is y s. Now I divide it yeah, by the distance between the observer and the source, and this defines yeah the vector angle theta s. So theta s yeah. Indeed, yeah, as a dimension of a of a of an angle, yeah, because I divide yeah two uh, <coughs> distances by each other. Okay, so it's like as if I would take the tangent, yeah, of the angle, but since the angle is so small, the angle is equal to the tangent expressed in radians, yeah. But you see, I may give a direction yeah to that angle, and therefore it is an angle vector. Okay. Okay, so theta s is angle vector locating the position of the source. Now theta is a vector angle locating the direction of the image I see, yeah, of the image that I see. <coughs> now, well, you see here there is another alpha without the, the hat, yeah. This is a, what we call the displacement angle vector. So it means it's angle vector between the true position of the source uh, yeah, and the image that I see. Yeah? Of course, the true position of the source, I never see it. Yeah? Okay? But I just indicate it on the graph. Yeah? And now, when writing the gravitational lensing equation, yeah, it's very simple. I just say the following. I just say that the difference between theta and theta is 
is equal to alpha. So you see, theta is this angle, theta is that angle. If I make this difference between the two, I find, of course, this angle. Yeah? This is easy. Now, what next? Uh, I shall try to relate this alpha to the Einstein deflection angle. Yeah? So, how should I do that? Yeah? You'll see. So, for the moment here, yeah, I forget about the vectors, yeah? just about uh, the angle. So, if I write sine alpha, so I, I'm just using now the law of the sines. Yeah? I'm just telling that the sine of this angle is to the opposite distance. So, opposite distance is distance between the deflector and the source. Just like the sine of this angle, but the sine of this angle is also equal to the sine of this supplementary angle here, is to the distance between the observer and the source. So just say this is equal to sine alpha hat divided by the distance between the observer and the source. Okay? Now these angles are so small that I just may forget about the sign. Yeah? Okay? And now, if I just uh, want to transform this here yeah, as an angle vector, I have to put here a minus sign, yeah? Because you see, alpha here goes in that direction from top to bottom rather than alpha hat, which is an Einstein deflection angle, goes from bottom to, to top. Yeah? So I have this relation between the two angles. So here, this equation be becomes the following. It's minus alpha hat divided by dos multiply by DDS. Immediately particularize yeah, that uh, equation to the case of the point, point mass object. Yeah? OK. Well, for the point mass object, yeah, this vectorial equation becomes a scalar equation. Why? Because, well, the gravitational lensing, as I said before, yeah, takes place in a plane yeah, that contains the source of light that I assume to be point-like, that contains the deflector, which is point, point mass, so point-like, and which contains the observer that I also assume yeah, is, is point-like. Yeah? So uh, this uh, <coughs> Equation becomes what? But, well, just that theta minus theta is, is equal to. Okay, here, this is an Einstein deflection angle, huh? which is this one, yeah? But I should take it as being a scalar relation, so I, I just look it's 4g divided by c squared times the mass divided by zeta, like this. Okay. Now there is a relation between zeta and theta. What is the relation? You agree that the tangent of theta, so the tangent of theta, which is this this one, is equal to the impact parameter divided by the distance between the observer and the deflector. Yeah? So this is equal to zeta divided by the distance between the observer and the deflector. Now here also, theta being so small, I may assume that the tangent is equal yeah, to the angle expressed in radian. Yeah? And so, well, this equation becomes the following one. Theta minus theta s is equal to 4j divided by c squared times the mass divided by zeta, but zeta is theta times DOD. So here I just write DOD times theta. Okay? 
So this equation here still becomes the following theta square minus theta s times theta uh, yes is equal to 4j divided by c square times m over dod. Oh, and now there is one thing I forgot, yeah? Uh, I, I forgot uh, this uh, caution. So here I should multiply by DDS over DOS. Here by DDS over DOS. Like this. Okay. Now l l let's assume, yeah, that... Uh, If theta s equals zero, yeah. If theta s equals zero, yeah, it means that I just uh, play the source along this perfect direction of alignment. Okay. Well, if theta s equals zero, I know that what I'm going to see is an Einstein ring. Okay. So what do I get in that case? Yeah. Well, here I get that theta square is equal, this is zero, yeah, 4j over c square times m divided by dod times dds uh, divided by dos, okay? But since it is the Einstein ring, yeah, well here I can just write it down that this is theta e square, theta Einstein ring, yeah, like that. Now, since this is equal to theta e square, so I can just write this is equal to theta e square, like that. You know the, the equation, yeah, of gravitational lensing comes theta square minus theta s times theta minus theta e square is equal to zero. And I shall just write this result here. Theta square minus theta s times theta minus theta e square is equal to zero. So this is the gravitational length equation for the case of a point mass deflector with the value of theta e equal to the square root of 4j over c square times the mass of the deflector times dds divided by dod times dos. So now, thanks to this equation, yeah, we are learning uh, many things. Yeah? Do you agree that this is uh, an equation of second degree in theta? Yeah? So if the determinant is non-negative, non yeah, it should always, should always have two solutions. Yeah? And later on, we will demonstrate that it's, the determinant is always positive. Yeah? So it means that, indeed, when uh, Light deflection yeah, is due to a point mass lens object. Yeah, there are always two lens images. But if theta is equal to zero, oh, then theta equal theta e, and then I see an Einstein ring. Yeah, and the Einstein ring has this angular radius. I see that the size of the Einstein ring is uh, directly proportional to the square root of the mass. Yeah. So if you take an object which is 100 times more massive than another one, yeah, the angular radius will be 10 times larger, yeah, square root of the mass. So interesting. Yeah? Okay, so here I, I just, I just showed it before. Now, yeah. Now what I'm going to show you 
is the following. Okay, we are getting two images here, but we need to characterize those images, yeah? yeah? And this is what uh, it will be about, yeah? So to make you understanding how we can find what is known as a magnification of the lens images, yeah? So it means that when you get two images, as we will see in a moment, yeah? One image is always bigger than the source, and one image is smaller than the source. Yeah? Okay, so... <coughs> what I'm doing now yeah, is the following. Yeah? Let's assume that uh, the, the, the blackboard yeah, represents the sky. Yeah? And you're looking yeah, at a gravitational lensing phenomenon here. So what I'm putting now here is a point mass lens. Yeah? So this is a point mass lens. And now I'm going to, to, to draw yeah, a very special kind of source. Yeah? So the source is the following. <coughs> so you'll see now, I'm just uh, considering well, I mean infinitesimally small source. Yeah? But here, for the purpose of drawing, yeah, I make it large, yeah, okay? And it is like that. Okay, and now it's all right. So if there is no, no lensing effect, yeah, this is what I see uh, projected on the sky. Yeah? So I see a point-like deflector, and then I see uh, this uh, part of a ring. Yeah? So this is circular, you see? OK, now if I consider yeah, this value from the deflector to here, this is what I've called theta s. Yeah? So theta s is a distance yeah, between the center of the deflector and the true position of the source. Yeah? So I find theta s here. Now, thanks to this equation, yeah, I will find two solutions. And what I will do now, I will just assume that I find theta 1. I just found theta 1. And theta 1 is the angle between the true position of the deflector and the image I see in the sky. Yeah? So maybe I we just come back to the previous diagram. Yeah, here. So you see theta is the angle between the position of the deflector and the direction of the image I see in the sky. Yeah? So I find that, well, theta is there, OK? Why not? I just show it like that. So this is theta. Now, if I ask you, well, let's assume now, and what is very important is that you see uh, the image the source image and the deflector are all located along the same line. And this is due to the fact that gravitational lensing takes place in a plane that contains the three elements. Yeah? And so what you see here, this line is intersection of that plane with the plane of the sky. Yeah? So there are just one line. Which means that now, if I would have considered yeah, uh, this other point here, which distance yeah, from the deflector is also theta s. Yeah? Well, I would find also, of course, that its image is located along that line, but at a distance theta 1. Yeah? So this is theta 1. So exactly the same distance here. And so if I consider, you see, all the points which are located yeah, on this portion of the circle, well, I, I'll find that the images here yeah, are all located also yeah, on a portion of a circle, but at a farther distance. Yeah? 
which is which is theta theta one. Yeah. Now well, I would do the same. Yeah, for this uh, other point. Well, here probably I would find yeah that <coughs> to this position. So this one I, I may call theta s one. Then I have theta s two. This is theta one. Well, I would find yeah for that other value of theta s one, I find another value for theta which is theta two. Yeah. So theta two, which is maybe uh, maybe here. And here also, yeah, you see, because they're along the same line, the image must be on that same line too. So this is theta two. Now, the image of this other point here, yeah, well, is also characterized by theta s two, which means that the image along that line should also be theta two. So I find here theta two. And I find, of course, that all the points located here yeah, on this circle arc yeah, are all located here yeah, on this circle arc, yeah, which is there. And so the image yeah, of uh, the first image of the source is simply this one. Well, since I, I told you, well, I made this, huh? well, for infinitesimally small images, yeah? instead of uh, naming this theta s1, I just say, well, this is theta s, and theta s2 is what I would call theta s plus d, d theta s, yeah? okay? So just a small in in increment, and here what I will get, here it's theta, and here would be theta plus d theta, d theta. Okay. And now, if I, I would like to know what is the magnification, yeah, well, how much bigger yeah, is the size of that image compared yeah, to the original source? I have just to divide yeah, the surfaces yeah, of those two images. Yeah? And what I I shall find yeah, is that the so-called uh, magnification mu is equal to what? Well, <clears throat> it's very easy. Uh, I just calculate yeah, the size of that uh, red, yeah, but infinitesimally small, yeah, area. So I can say the, follow so the following. Let's assume that the Opening angle yeah, between the two lines is d phi. Yeah, I find that the red area. So here the amplification yeah, is a yellow area divided by the red area, which is equal to what? So first. I should like to know what is the length yeah, of this uh, small arc. So, well, this is simply uh, theta s times d phi. So, this is theta s times d phi times the width. At the width, it's d theta s. And now, what is the size of that area? It's the same. You would say I calculate the length of this arc, which is theta times d phi, and now ti times the width, yeah? the length times the width, and the width, it's d theta. So I see there is a nice simplification, and I find that the amplification or magnification is simply equal to theta d theta divided by theta s d theta s. Okay? So once that I shall have found, yeah, uh, well, for a given uh, situation, what are the two roots of that equation? Yeah, well, I shall be able, of course, to calculate yeah, the value yeah, of the magnifications characterizing the two lens images.
And this is the result I have just indicated here, yeah, that the amplification yeah, is theta d theta for the image i, and i may take the values 1 or 2, yeah, divided by t theta, t theta s, d theta, d theta s. Well, this is an example where by selecting, properly selecting yeah, the shape of a source, you find the correct answer yeah, very simply. Otherwise, it would have been possible, but it would have taken me 20 minutes yeah, to go through uh, the Jacobian matrix of the transformation when going from theta s to theta, and we would have found the same result, but it would have taken 20 minutes more. <coughs> so here I come back yeah, to the previous uh, light ray tracing diagram I showed you already before. Yeah? And uh, what we are going to do now, it's just to solve the equation here. Yeah? Uh, after I, I shall show you an optical gravitational lensing experiment, it's what we are, we were just bringing now. It's just, uh, well, simulating the light source of a quasar. Then uh, I have a screen here which will simulate the observer plane, yeah? And then a lens, yeah? That I shall, shall show you in a moment, yeah? And you, you will see that you may even uh, perform that experiment yourself at home, if you want. Okay. So I shall explain to you what this diagram represents, yeah? And how it can be used graphically to find the solutions of the gravitational lens equation. I can rewrite it like that, yeah? I can write that it's a theta square, or should I divide by theta maybe, yeah? Yeah, I divide by theta, so this equation becomes theta minus theta s is equal to theta e square divided by theta. You agree? And now, in this equation, yeah, I may say, oh, this is a, a function y of theta, let's assume, yeah, which represent, yeah, in a diagram y versus theta, simply the equation of straight line. It is the equation of a straight line <coughs> with a slope of one. Yeah? So if I say, yeah, y theta or y theta one is equal to theta minus theta s. And if I represent it versus theta, <coughs> I find that this is just the equation of a straight line with a slope equal to 1. So it's 45 degree line. Yeah? So <coughs> here you see for a particular value of theta s, yeah, I just uh, drew a straight line passing through that value because when y is equal to 0, theta is equal to theta s. So here is the interse intersection, yeah? Is theta equal to theta s, then a straight line, 45 degrees. Now the second equation, uh, well, second side of the equation, y, y2 of theta is theta e squared divided by theta. And this is the equation of a parabola, yeah? Oh, no, not a parabola, hyperbola, hyperbola, yeah? And here is the hyperbola represented, one branch, and then the second branch yeah, to the negative values. Yeah? So this is y1, and this is uh, y2 of theta. And I see that solving this equation graphically yeah, is just to find the intersection between yeah, the two curves. So, so you see, <coughs> you draw yeah, the two branches of the hyperbola. Then for a theta s, which is given, you just trace a 45 degree line. And then the two intersection point here one, point two, gives you the location of the two, two images. You see? So it's a graphical construction, yeah? So what I propose to do, yeah, I will just make a construction, yeah? So that you see how I do. So here is y. Here is theta. Okay. Now the two branches of the parabola. Okay. 
And now if I say, well, I'm just selecting a theta s. So what I do, theta equal theta s, yeah? I just measure here. And maybe what, what, what I will do is the following. Let's assume that I have here So this is this is a deflector here, or maybe I, I make it lower here. This is another diagram below. So this is a projection on the sky, okay? So let's assume that here we have the deflector. So the deflector is exactly at position zero zero. And now the source, I will put it in red. So the source, let's assume. I put it here. I just do something like before yeah, in red, so it will be very clear for you what what I'm doing. So we'll be able to make the the connection between the two. Yeah. Now let's assume that I'm trying to to find out. Where are the two images due to that source element, which is point-like? Yeah, so it's a point. Yeah. So what I do, I just measure here theta equal theta s. Now I will draw the line, forty-five degrees. Yeah. So. So this is more or less. 45 degrees, huh? okay. Draw a line. Oops. Like this. Now I got, I'm getting two intersecting points here and here. What I do now, yeah, I'm trying to find what are the values of this intersection. And this is theta 2 here and here is theta 1 here, OK? Now what I know, yeah, and this is very important, I know that the images yeah, should be located yeah, on this stray line somewhere. And here I continue on the other side. And to find where they are, now I just from here, from the top, from theta one, yeah, I just go down and find here that this is theta one, and on the other side, theta two. And I find that it is more or less here. Okay. Yeah. Now, if I, I I try to find where are the images of the, this or the point. Well, I do exactly the same, yeah? I will just trace now straight line like that. As you go there. Okay. And I know, because this is the same distance, theta s, theta s, that the theta corresponding to that point will be here. And so I find here the locus yeah, of all the images corresponding yeah, to this red side. After I can do this similar thing yeah, for second point here. So exactly what I should do, yeah, you see? I measure from, from here to here. I find 14 centimeters. Then I put here 14 centimeter here. Now by this point, I will just trace a line, 45 degrees. Now I'm getting two other intersections. Okay. Now I just will find what are those values. Now I measure, for instance, this one. Huh? 
I find that it is 17 centimeters. So now I go here, I put 17 centimeters with a yellow, with a yellow line. I put here. Then for the, the other point, which is here, I would find that the image is here, more or less. Then I just trace, and I find the yellow images on one side. Now, on the other side, so the second image is that one. Here I measure, it is uh, three centimeters, so I come here. I measure three centimeters, and I find that the secondary images will be this one. You see? How it's possible graphically, yeah? Just with a, a compass, yeah? And a, a, rule, a ruler, yeah? Makes a graphical construction. Now let's go for the analytical solution, yeah? which some uh, students prefer. Yeah? So solving that equation yeah, leads me to determine what is a determinant. Yeah? So it will, it will be b square, so it's theta s square minus 4 ac. So it will be plus 4 theta e square. And I find that this is always positive. Which means that the two solutions, theta 1 and theta 2, huh, will be equal to theta s plus or minus square root of theta s square plus 4 theta e square divided by 2. Okay? Or I can still write this uh, in the following way. Yeah? It says that it's theta s. Okay plus or minus delta divided by 2 if I define theta being equal to theta s square plus 4 theta e square. So I, I find that there is always a, one position which is positive and a second position which is negative. And therefore, here we find one image on one side and one image on the other side. Well, if I made a mistake, yeah, don't hesitate to tell me. Yeah. I'm not sure everything is correct, but probably. Yeah. Okay, now, well, what is the angular distance between the two images? Yeah? So between this image and the, the other yellow image? Well, it's theta 1 minus theta 2. Theta 1 minus theta 2 is equal to, well, twice this. It's equal to delta. So it's equal to the square root of theta s square plus 4 theta e square. So I see that the separation between the two lens images here yeah, is of the order of this. And since usually theta s, theta s is very small, yeah, because you are very near to a perfect alignment, yeah, so this is equal more or less yeah, to 2 theta e. And 2 theta e is the angular diameter of the Einstein ring. Yeah? So what we find is that in case of a perfect alignment, we get an Einstein ring. If we are not perfectly aligned, the ring breaks into two images, but whose separation is still of the order of the angular diameter of the Einstein ring. Yeah. So it's a good idea. Now, just uh, for your information, yeah, uh, if I consider yeah, 
here a star which is located at cosmological distance yeah, and which act as a micro lens. Yeah? So I take a quasar, then a star in a galaxy, yeah, or, or, or an individual star, but at, at cosmological distance, so at the typical distances of the galaxies. What is the value of the angular diameter? Yeah? Typically, is, it is of the order of the micro arc second, to 10 to the minus 6 arc second yeah? for one star. Okay, now if I take a galaxy, yeah, which is composed of 10 to the 12, well, 10 exponent 12 yeah, stars, yeah? so it's uh, 1,000 billion stars. Yeah? The size of the angular radius yeah, is proportional to the square root of the mass. Yeah? So square root of 10 to the 12 will be 10 to the 6. So 1 micro arc seconds times 10 to the 6, it's 1 arc second. Yeah? So we find that typically, if a galaxy is responsible yeah, for gravitational enhancing effect, the separation between the multiple images will be of the order of one second of arc. If it is a single star, one micro arc second. Yeah? Now, we could also wonder, and now, if we take a, not a galaxy, but a cluster of galaxies, yeah, composed of 100 galaxies, yeah? well, it will be 100 times more massive. Yeah? So the angular radius will be still square root of 100 times bigger, which is 10, factor 10. So instead of having one second of arc, then we'll get 10 second of arc. Yeah? And well, in, in the sky, yeah, we know yeah, some quasars with a separation of more than 10 seconds of arc. Yeah? And this can be a nice project yeah? uh, when you will get access to the telescope. Yeah? You will be asked to We'll make a small observing program. Yeah. Well, the program could be well, take images yeah, of a one multiple image quasar with a large separation, so that you don't need a big telescope. But even with a small telescope, yeah, it will work. Yeah, and uh, we'll try to get it in uh, different colors. And then, if you get uh, images taken in three colors, you can make a nice color picture. <laughs> and uh, now, if you if you succeed in taking uh, frames at different epochs, then you may look for variability if the multiple components yeah, stayed stable or could show some variations. Yeah? So it's a very, very, very nice small program yeah, to be carried out. Yeah? Okay, now what we need uh, still to calculate yeah, are the magnification of the images. Yeah? Magnification is given by this formula. Okay, So I could say mu i for i equal 1 or 2, is equal to theta i d theta i divided by theta s d theta s. Yeah? And i may take the value of 1 or 2. So let's, let's do, let's, let's go. So mu i equal theta i d theta i divided by theta s d theta s. So, Theta i over theta s is this thing, yeah? yeah? It will be <coughs> theta s plus or minus delta over 2 theta s. You agree with that, huh? Yes? Yes. That's okay, huh? Now, the most, more difficult part yeah, is d theta i divided by d theta s. So I just come here, yeah? So <coughs> it would be one half multiplied by one plus or minus, yeah? Then I have one half divided by a square root of theta s square plus four theta e square in here times two theta s. Yeah. Okay, the two and the two yeah, gets away. And now I have to multiply this by that. <coughs> so I find that mu i is equal to theta s plus or minus delta over excuse me. 
So you multiply uh, by this one first, and then by the other one. So still one half. So here it will be one fourth times one plus or minus theta s over delta. Like that. And maybe it's here that I should uh, distribute everything. So it's equal to 1 over 4 theta s multiplied by, here I will get theta s plus or minus theta a square over delta now plus or minus delta and now if I multiply plus minus plus minus it will be plus theta s so theta s plus or minus theta square over delta, plus or minus delta, and then plus theta s. Yeah? Or not? So, if it's correct, yeah, plus theta s, plus theta s will be here, plus 2 theta s. And uh, if I write yeah, the things as they were written there, it would be equal to 1 half, or one quarter, okay, one quarter, multiply by, now this will go here, yeah? so it will be two, that's okay, now plus or minus, I open the parentheses, I have theta a square, yeah, so theta square over delta plus delta. So w what we see, we are missing a one over theta s, yeah? So, but where where did I forget it? Yeah? No, yeah, but I divided by theta s, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, and here? And theta s, then? Then, oh yeah, that's simple, in here theta s, correct. Yeah. Yeah, and you get, you obtain the same result. Yeah, so it's correct. Yeah, well, so when I divide by theta s, I only divided the first one. Yeah, but I should also divide the third and the fourth one. Yeah, okay. So we, we get exactly the same expression. Yeah, and then you may see that the one mu i yeah, is a positive value, and one mu i is a negative value, and this is accounting for the fact that one of the lens image yeah is straight, and one image is reversed. Yeah, and this is a, the origin of the sign minus. Yeah. Now, if we l let's assume that you are observing yeah, a gravitational lensing effect, where the two images yeah, are too near to each other. Yeah, okay, because our separation is maybe one micro arc second or even one milli arc second. So what you will see yeah, is that the light you receive from this effect yeah, is not a magnification, but it is an amplification. Yeah? Because indeed, if this is the real source, the size of the source, yeah, well then maybe the images will be like that, okay? so you don't see the source. And you will integrate yeah, the flux from those two images. So in that case we will say, well, we witness an amplification. Yeah? Because you cannot resolve the images. In other words, the amplification is given by that formula, of course, but you have now to add, yeah, in modulus, the two amplification. Because, well, if one of the image is reverted, yeah, it doesn't mean that it is not amplified. Yeah? <clears throat> so let's, let's add now the two uh, amplifications. So I will say the total amplification is then equal to what? module mu i, mu 1, plus modulus of mu 2. And if I just add these two, I find that it is uh, 1 half 
t tiles over delta plus delta over t tiles. Yeah, because this sign goes away. And it is the result which is shown here. In 1985, yeah, uh, Bogdan Paczynski yeah, was an astrophysicist from Warsaw, but then working uh, in uh, Harvard, well, no, in Princeton, was a professor in Princeton. In 1985, he said, well, if you calculate yeah, the probability of having micro in the galaxy, so that one star of our galaxy pass very near to the line of sight of another one, yeah, just found that the probability was about 10 to the minus 6. One over one million, yeah? And he said, well, now we have uh, adequate detectors, yeah, called CCDs, covering a big focal plane, so that if we point, yeah, the telescope in the galactic bulge, yeah, or towards a large Magellanic cloud or the small Magellanic cloud, where you have a very high density of stars, yeah, you'll get on your CCD detector more than one million stars, yeah? So it means that in one frame, you are sure that you will witness at least one microlensing effect. Yeah? And then a big campaign yeah, has been uh, set up by him and uh, various people, of course, co-working, collaborating with him in uh, Las Campanas. And uh, it, it is known as the Ogle Project. It's an optical gravitational lensing experiment. And uh, I can just summarize the story by telling that today, every year, about 2,000 microlensing events are detected. Yeah? So what they're looking at, yeah? they're taking images one after the other, typically every 10 minutes, non-stop. And among the millions of stars they're recording, they try to see if there is no, not one obeying yeah, that relation. OK? So we see that. The total amplification yeah, is equal yeah, to one half t times over delta plus delta over t times. And delta is given by this formula. So theta s squared plus four theta e squared. So you see that here in that formula, we see the ratio of t times over delta or the inverse. Yeah? So let's calculate delta over t times. So this will be equal to, I'm dividing this, 1 plus 4 theta e over theta s squared. Okay? And I see that in the expression of the total amplification, undergone by a star, subject to the microlensing effect, yeah? the only important quantity which appears yeah, is this one, theta e over theta, theta s. Yeah? So theta e over theta s. Now, in practice, yeah, what happens in the, in the projection of the, of the sky? Well, the following situation is that you have a foreground star, which is nearer to you. And then there is a background star, yeah, maybe, which is here. So this is a deflector. And this is the source. And if you are lucky, yeah, if this star, yeah, moves with respect to the other one like that and comes very near along the line of sight, yeah, you will see formation of multiple images yeah, of the background star by the foreground one. Yeah? So let's assume that the star is at this position. So what will happen? Well, along the line joining the two stars, yeah, two images will appear. One will be located here, yeah? and then a fainter one will be located here. But because of the poor resolution of your telescope, you, you will not see that, yeah? because the angular separation is too small. So what you will witness is just a 
amplification of light yeah, of the background star going up and then going down, yeah, simply. Okay, now what are the parameters which are in place here? Well, I would say the following. So I make a, a new graph again. So the foreground star, and now this is a background star. So wh what is important to know yeah, is what is this distance? Because this is theta s. Yeah, this is theta s. Now you see, well, what I can say is that the smaller angular separation between the two will be here theta mean, yeah, which is a kind of an impact parameter. Yeah? And now what I may write down is that theta s yeah, is equal, let's assume that at the time uh, t equals 0, the star will be here. Then I could say, OK, this is, uh, well, an x is x, and this distance, I would say, is theta x. Yeah? So what I may write is that theta s is equal to the square root of theta x square plus theta mean square. OK? And now theta x, I could say, well, it is nothing else than an angular velocity yeah, so it's a dt, d theta dt, yeah, times the time, the time here at, uh, so when the star will be here, yeah, I, I will say, okay, I set the time to t equals zero on my watch, yeah. Okay, now I'm, what I'm getting here is that theta s is equal to the square root of theta dot square time, the square of the time, plus theta min square, OK? But in the expression of the amplification, yeah, what I see as parameters is the ratio yeah, of theta s over theta e. Yeah? So what is important yeah, is theta s over theta e which is equal to the square root of theta dot over theta e square times t square plus theta min over theta e square, like that, OK? And I see, well, in this equation, mu t, which is entirely defined by this ratio, which is the following expression, the two unknown yeah, are this, because this is a time I may measure with my watch, and this. Now, in practice, when people are monitoring yeah, the flux of a star subject to gravitational lensing, what they do? Well, they just plot here the total amplification as a function of time, yeah? And what typically you see, well, when there is no lensing, lensing you make measurement here, and then, oh, all of a sudden, it goes something like that, and then it goes down, it is symmetric, and this is the time t equals 0, yeah? And this is before t equals 0, after t equals 0. And what they do, yeah? They just fit, yeah, this expression using two parameters, yeah? And they are very successful, yeah? They just get a very good fitting going through all the points. And the only parameters they may infer, yeah? is the angular velocity of the star 
with respect to the length, but angular velocity, normalized to the size of the Einstein radius that we don't know. Yeah? But you only get uh, this. And then they get also the quantity tetamine over theta e, which is the minimum angular separation. Yeah? The star, background star, will pass near the foreground one, but also normalized to the angular radius of the Einstein ring. Yeah? So <clears throat> these are not uh, many parameters, yeah? useful parameters. Yeah? And therefore, I mean, um, well, right now, yeah, in our team, yeah, we, we have applied yeah, for observing time with an interferometer at, the, at ISO Paranel to get in addition yeah, to the photometric curves yeah, direct images. Yeah. But for that, you need an interferometer because you need a very high angular resolution which cannot be achieved with a single telescope. So this is a story about this thing. So do you have questions about that? Yeah. Yes? I don't understand why magnification will go, uh, means it will uh, get a peak, then it will come same as before. Means why it oh yeah. It's very easy to understand because, uh, can I, I can clear? The, the, the blackboard, yeah. So you see, this is a foreground star, yeah. And we, we assume for simplicity that it is a background star which is moving with respect to the foreground one. But if you assume that it is a, a foreground one which is moving with respect to the background one, is the same conclusion. And you may also assume that both are moving, yeah, yeah. Okay. So here, what I show, I just assume that this one is not moving, yeah, to make things. More simple, and here, yeah, is a background star. Yeah. So, when we are very far away, very very far away here, position one. So we are prob probably there. Yeah, no magnification. Okay. Yeah. Now this is position two. Oh, we are getting closer. Yeah, probably we are here. Position two. Now this is maximum maximum amplification position three, yeah, because it is the closest, yeah. And this is three, okay. And now, of course, symmetrically, yeah, there is no reason why, if the star goes here, that it should not be symmetric here. It should be absolutely symmetric. You see? Yeah. So it is absolutely symmetric. Is it realistic or by simulation only we can achieve? No, yeah, it is observed. Many, many, many. <laughs> so every year among the 2,000, yeah, probably 1,950 looks look look like that. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, it's very easy to pick them up. Yeah, yeah. Because well, there 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 doesn't exist any other variable star which shows such a behavior. Yeah. Yeah, thanks to that symmetry. Yeah. And now also, if it happens once, yeah, it should not happen a second time because the probability of having one micro lensing fn even is 10 minus 6. Yeah? So if you would see the star doing this exactly the same yeah, twice, it would be very suspect. And they've never seen that. Yeah? Yeah? So it happens only once. Because otherwise, the probability would be 10 to the minus 12 that it happens twice. Yeah, yeah. Now, and th this is very interesting. Yeah, sometimes, yeah, for the remaining cases, yeah, it's not like that. Yeah, and uh, so it, it happens sometimes that. Well, th this is what had been predicted, and it, it has been observed. You may see things like that, yeah? And usually the reason of that, yeah, is that here around the star is gravitating a planet, yeah? So, and the effect of the planet, yeah, will be to induce, yeah, another additional amplification. 
And this is a technique, yeah, a very good technique to detect the presence of exoplanets around other stars. Yeah. It's micro lensing. Yeah, by micro lensing technique. Yeah. Now it happens sometimes that the the foreground star, yeah, the foreground star is double. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because we know that many stars in the galaxy are double stars, yeah? And then, uh, well, everything gets more complicated, of course, yeah? Because, well, we, we could do the whole theory again, yeah? But instead of taking one point mass object, we have to take two point mass objects, yeah? And, of course, I mean, there are nonlinear effects, yeah? And, well, the, the theory is not difficult but it's complex yeah and uh, it has been laid down yeah long time ago and uh, now all over the world I, as i said there is a ogl experiment going on so the optical gravitational lensing experiment in, in las campanas so every day they are monitoring the the bulge of the milky way or the magellanic clouds and they are reporting events yeah so if you have 2000 events per year it means that Per day, yeah, you have about six, seven e event every day, yeah. And uh, so there is um, internet access yeah, to those data, and they, they they show, for instance, yeah, that these are the points and these are the predictions. And sometimes it happens, yeah. Whoa, here there is a departure from prediction, yeah. Then an alert is sent to many observatories. Yeah? And many people take their telescopes. And now they, you get many, extremely many data points because many telescopes yeah, are monitoring. And thanks to that, yeah, they may uh, <coughs> identify the nature yeah, of the additional object responsible for this. Yeah? And very often it is an exoplanet. Yeah? Okay. Okay, just pass by. So you see, this is was one of the exercise proposed yeah, in the in the lecture notes. But it's just to ask. This is a question at, at the exam. Yeah, we sometimes ask. Yeah, well, what are the parameters? Yeah, which can be derived from the fitting of a microlensing curve? Yeah, and well, here you have the, the two parameters. Yeah, so. It's not difficult. Okay, now I come here to another subject. Yeah, I have de depicted on the left side. Yeah, a gravitational lensing effects. So you have a parallel light rays coming from a very distant source. There, here we have a point mass lens, and the rays get deflected. Yeah, so this is a observer which is who is perfectly aligned. And we'll see an Einstein ring. And here is another observer, yeah, not perfectly aligned. And he sees two images, yeah. Now, well, uh, an idea we had, uh, well, many years ago, probably, yeah, 20 years ago, was, well, could we design yeah, an optical lens, yeah, to simulate identical effects, yeah? So instead of using gravity, we would use optics, but try to simulate, yeah, in a very honest way, yeah, gravitational lensing. So the idea is to find uh, what should be the shape of the lens, given a mass, a certain mass distribution, and the mass distribution could be a point mass lens, or it could be uh, a spiral galaxy, it could be a globular cluster, what, anything, yeah. And in fact, uh, it's very easy, yeah. This is something, uh, yeah, something we did with uh, Revsdal, yeah, uh, in 1993. So I will show you the idea. Okay. So here we have the impact parameter. We have the Einstein deflection angle, and here we say, okay, with our optical lens, we would like that for a given impact parameter, we get a deflection angle that now I call epsilon, epsilon, because it's out of optical glass, yeah? Now, what, what I would like to know is that, well, for that given impact parameter, yeah, 
what should be the thickness of the lens yeah, at that place yeah, to simulate the effect. Yeah. Okay, first of all, yeah, we decide that a lens has two, two faces. Yeah. So one face will take a plane because we know that when a light ray yeah, falls on a perpendicularly yeah, to this flat, flat side, yeah, it will not be deflected, yeah? so it's very easy. Yeah? So the ray comes here. Yeah? The ray comes here. Then uh, due to refraction, yeah, well, it is deflected yeah, because uh, there is a glass or plastic yeah, in, the, in the lens. And what we know yeah, is that uh, the snell descartes law applies here. So we can say uh, the sign of this angle to the sign of that angle yeah, is equal to the refraction index of the lens. Yeah. So I just write this first relation, sine i over sine r is equal to n. But since the angles are very small, yeah, I can say okay, this is also equal about yeah, to i over r, yeah, because the angles are very small. Now the real deflection angle, yeah, for that uh, impact parameter, which, which is zeta, yeah, is epsilon, yeah, which depends on zeta. Yeah. And what I see is that epsilon of zeta well, is simply equal to i minus r. Yeah. So this is really equal to i minus r. Now, what I, 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 I can still write, yeah? So I'm trying now to find, yeah, what the relation of the thickness of the lens as a function of the impact parameter, yeah, zeta, yeah? This is a problem. The delta axis is along that direction, and the impact parameter, zeta, yeah, here, is along that direction, yeah? So what I can write, yeah, is that the derivative of delta as a function of zeta yeah, corresponds yeah, at this point yeah, to the slope of the tangent to the surface I'm trying to determine. Yeah? Okay? So the, the slope yeah, to that <coughs> surface, which is unknown to me, is just represented by d delta over d zeta. Yeah? And now well, what I see is that well, this tangent is perpendicular to the normal, yeah? So this is the normal, yeah, at that point, yeah? And now, well, this vertical axis is perpendicular to this one, yeah? So the value of the slope is nothing else than the angle r. So it's the tangent of r, but I can say, okay, it's r, and now I put a sign minus, minus, because I want that the thickness of my lens decrease as the impact parameter increase. Yeah? Okay? Okay, so, well, from this relation, yeah, uh, what can I find? Well, from this relation, I find that R is equal to I minus epsilon, correct? I think so, huh? yeah? Now, when I go up, yeah, so R is still equal to I, but I is equal to N times R, N times R, minus Epsilon. And I still go up, and I find, therefore, that R is equal to Epsilon over N minus 1. Yeah, so R is equal yeah, to Epsilon divided by N, N minus 1, okay? So here, at the end, I found that this derivative is equal to minus epsilon over n minus 1. And of course, yeah, the deflection angle epsilon is equal to the Einstein deflection angle, yeah, which is equal to 4j over c squared uh, times the mass of the deflector divided by the impact parameter. Okay. So my equation yeah, reduced to 
The derivative of the thickness as a function of the impact parameter is equal to minus 4j over c square times the mass divided by n minus 1 multiplied by 1 over zeta. So this is a constant, yeah? I would say, okay, I should call this a constant, k, big k. So this is equal to minus k over zeta. And so this equation here yeah, becomes that the differential of delta is equal to minus k times d zeta over zeta, okay? Now I may integrate this, it's very easy, integrate. I integrate yeah, here from, uh, okay, I would say from an impact parameter zero. And here, this will be the maximal thickness, delta zero, yeah. Okay, and now, well, I just put another variable here. I will go to zeta. In here, I will find delta. So it's easy. I find that the thickness for the value of the impact parameter zeta, or here I could put uh, zeta zero. Yeah. Is it minus the value of the impact of the thickness for the value of the impact parameter zeta zero is equal to minus k times the uh, Neperian logarithmic of zeta divided by zeta zero, okay? And of course, the, the thickness yeah, for a value of the impact parameter is equal to that thickness minus k times logarithmic Neperian of zeta over zeta zero. Okay, the demonstration yeah, is in the notes. And here are the results, yeah? Uh, the shape, yeah, of the, of the lens, yeah, is like that, yeah? So, just uh, driven by the Neperian log logarithmic, yeah? So it goes to infinity as yes, zeta goes to zero, yeah? And then it's uh, slightly moving out, outside, yeah? So this is, uh, you see, the shape of the lens, yeah? Just pass by to show you. The idea now is, uh, I'm just looking at the time, yeah, it's okay, it's fine. We shall make after an optical gravitational lensing experiment with the lens to show you how it works, yeah? So, we assume later on, yeah, uh, that we we could consider different mass distributions. This would be a singular isothermal sphere well corresponding yeah, to most of the mass distributions observed in galaxies. Yeah? This would be a spiral lens galaxy seen from the top and so on. Yeah? Yeah? This is a, well, this is a, in fact a converging lens corresponding to a mass distribution due to the plane of matter with a constant surface density, but inf going at infinity. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you may just uh, take any mass distribution in, in constructing yeah, the corresponding, yeah. This, this was one of the first lens we did with my wife, yeah, we just polished it, yeah. And the first one took us about 50 hours of time yeah, to, to get to a fine polishing. And after, well, after we, we made more, but then we, 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 we bought some tools, yeah? electric tools, and uh, it was much faster. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is two lenses, yeah, which, yeah, I think it's the last year. They are since the year 2000. It's at the 
National Air and Space Science Museum in Washington. Yeah? Some people ask us yeah, to provide them with lenses, and these are two lenses we manufactured for them. So it is in an exhibition there, and uh, they correspond to a spiral, spiral lens galaxies. Yeah. Okay, well, then I, this I don't see with you because, uh, okay, this not either. But once during a lecture, many a long time ago, yeah, ten years ago probably, I asked the students, well, do you think it would be possible to do the same with not by transmission but by reflection, by reflection, yeah? So just like a mirror, yeah? To simulate gravitational lensing effects by by reflection. And then one student well, I, I asked them just to to think about it, yeah. And well, in case they would find a solution, just to come and show me, yeah. And then I was very surprised that the next week, yeah, this student came with this horn, yeah, it is a horn, yeah. Hunting horn, yeah. C'est un corps de chasse. Hein? And uh, he just said, well, this, this is uh, the correct shape, yeah? The reflective lens should have yeah, to see multiple images. And probably, yeah, you see, uh, here is one, one image, here is a second image. You see, uh, the two images of the candle, yeah? But there are many uh, bad reflections because it's not a perfect lens, yeah? It was not made for, yeah, but, but it works, yeah? And then, since then, any times I see a band of music, yeah, I'm taking pictures, 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 yeah. This was in uh, Honolulu, yeah, a long time ago. But you see, these, these are perfect simulators, yeah, of uh, lensing due to a black hole, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, I propose that we, we set up the optical experiment to show you how it works, yeah, so that this enables you to reproduce all gravitational lensing effects that you may think of, yeah? So, <clears throat> even, I didn't say so, but then we have demonstrated that to simulate non-symmetric mass distributions, yeah? Which <coughs> usually happen in the universe, yeah? Things are very scarcely symmetric. The way to introduce an asymmetry is just to tilt the lens. Just by tilting, you may account for an asymmetry in the mass distribution. Yeah? And so I will show you the resulting images also. So here is a quasar. So it's a strong source of light. And maybe I will set it up here. <coughs> 